Hello, everybody. This is Jen. I'm Alicia, and we're here to go over and read Managing by the Numbers. We're going to be reading Chapter 4 today. But we want to talk a little bit about Chapter 3 because there were some things that were a little rushed and a little bit confusing. So I want Jen, who's way more expert than I am, to kind of explain and go over the, the terms and the um, the explanation of what the book was meaning to say. And it did a fine job, but we just want to go a little bit more beyond. So Jen, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what you think about chapter three? Well, first of all, I'm Jennifer Kaysen. So I'm actually uh, studying these things as well. So I am not a licensed accountant or anything like that. I'm just studying these and learning along the way with Alicia. So I actually have a textbook that is business accounting and I'm pulling reference from business accounting to apply with the book managing by the numbers so to clarify because some things are a little rushed through there like what she was saying just kind of there's some there's some missing pieces to the link so um as far as the income statements go there's actually um this goes into there's four different types of financial statements you have an income statement there's a retained earnings statement and then there's also a balance sheet and statement of cash flows. So we are actually starting at the beginning with the income statement and breaking that down, which was on page, I think, is that 26, Alicia? That is page 29. You want the 20, there's 29. one on 26? No, that's fine. Cause I can remember if it was 26 or 29. Okay, it's 29. So there's also one thing that came up in chapter two that we went over. So it was actually goodwill. So that's not on that one, but it was on the one in chapter two. Mm -hmm. Goodwill is dealing with intangible assets. Sometimes we think that goodwill is like your donations to charities, things like that. This is actually different. Goodwill is your intangible assets, which are things that you cannot hold, retain. It's just on paper or licensed through a company. So these are your patents and copyrights. So when you actually copyright or trademark your company name, certain logos, that is actually covered under your goodwill. So, and then it actually deals with trade names. So if you're using different types of trade names underneath that business name or trademark or copyrighted name, those are included as well. And that also gives you the exclusive right to use those in any form or fashion. So you have rights, laws, like rights through the law to actually have those and use those however you want to. That's and interesting. Why does it go under goodwill? Because these are intangible assets. Anything that is goodwill is intangible. So we don't have like cost of goods or, you know, your your employee or your equipment, these kinds of things. This is something that really is a kind of an entity of its own that even though it's there and we're using it to monetize with the company, we're using these names and trademarks to secure our business name and logo and everything. It is not something that we are actually pulling from. So if, if I'm going, if I'm, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So if I'm like right now, I'm in, I'm in the middle of like creating the perfect logo. So that mm -hmm. time, maybe like the hour that I spent doing that, would I expense that? No. Okay. No, it's when you actually license it, mm. you pay the fees to actually for the copyright, for the trademark those kinds of things. And it does have a lifespan to it. So certain trademarks have a certain lifespan, certain copyrights have a certain lifespan. It depends on what um, site, what area you're in, because there's like clothing, like it, like in businesses, there's the different breakdowns for trademarking, copywriting, and all that kind of stuff. They do have different time spans, lifespans on them. And then you have to go back in and renew them. So it is, something that you have but it's something that you don't actually hold or you it's just kind of over in a corner sitting hmm. there that's good to know so you do pay the fees on them but it's not at a constant like you're paying um like if you're paying for subscriptions or things like it's not like that either so, so like paying the domain name would that go under there uh no domain name actually goes underneath um we'll go under business expenses okay because it is something that you're paying it. So the trademark and stuff is like a one-time thing. Then you right. have to go back and renew it. Where your domain names, you're paying every year on those. So it's actually a short-term liability, not a long-term like your, your goodwill is. 
thank you for clarifying that. Okay, yeah, so continue so, so, on the other statement. Do you have thing you wanted to talk so about? So what we're going through, when they were talking here, one thing is like the cost of goods sold. Um, and on page 30, it was, they put COGS. But as you look on the on the page where Alicia's, Alicia's got up, it's actually cost of goods sold. Some people shorten it. I, I don't, that can get confusing because there's a lot of other um, things that are actually shortened that are actually more important than trying to remember these things. So cost of goods sold is just easier to do that because like I said, they don't actually shorten it on the income statement. So it can, I would just, it's there. It makes a point. You can simplify if you need to in your brain, but that is just more difficult for me to remember COGS instead of cost of goods sold. So for COGS for me, it could actually be like if you need certain things um, for your equipment or business, that kind of thing. So, but other than that, it's just finding the right income statement that works for you is super important because everybody's business works differently. So taking the time to go over the four different types of financial statements and then with the income statement, breaking it down, what's going to work best for you because some people deal with a lot of cash on hand and don't have accounts receivable, accounts payable, that kind of thing, because they deal with cash only. Uh, in my sewing business, that's what I did. I did not have accounts receivable. Everything was cash or cash or checks. So it was immediate cash into my account. So, but when you actually have a business where you actually have inventory, you're going to have to set that up slightly different. So that is where talking with an accountant to find out really what's going to be the best for you is worth its money in doing that. And a lot of accountants will talk to you for free. And then that's great to build that rapport because if your business changes or shifts, then you can go back to your that account that you've already started building a rapport with and then be able to feel more secure about the advice they are giving you as well. So I have an accountant. I call him when I'm like, get changes in my world. And so he's able to help and direct me. So, and I actually have a certified public accountant who also deals with business and large companies as well. So that is really good to have because then they know the business side as well and can help you sit down and actually break things down and what's going to work best for you. Yep. Okay, so we're good. We're good. I'm okay, so so let's start reading chapter four, and um, which is called cash flow. Not too much there. I'm gonna take a little penguin out. Cash flow, the one statement you really can't do without. A positive bottom line on the income statement showing that your company is making profit is surely a good thing. On the other hand, profitability is no guarantee of success or even survival. Every year, tens of thousands of businesses fail. Some were showing a profit at their demise. What happened? Simple. They didn't have enough cash to stay in business. They grew broke. You can operate a long time without profit, said Lou Mobley, but you can't survive one day without cash. Cash is real money. It's what you have in the bank. Information about cash coming in and cash going out, cash flow, isn't abstract. It's concrete. A statement of cash flow doesn't reflect what things were worth five years ago or how much they have depreciated since. It doesn't assume that you could sell everything in your inventory tomorrow. It tells you how much you deposited in your bank account, how much you wrote checks for, and what the difference was during a specific time span. Cash information helps lenders know whether you can pay them back. Cash information tells you whether you can buy a truck today and still make payroll next week. Cash information is the other half of your business transactions, the part where you settle up accounts with your vendors and get paid by your customers. Just as the income statement has nothing to do with cash, the cash statement has nothing to do with promises and agreement or accrual. It shows what's actually going in and going out. It tells you how a good job, how good a job you're you're doing at turning profits into cash. Funny thing, before 1987, accounts did did not had not done much to help companies track their cash and we're and we're all looking way back to the 14th century um, the basics of accounting slowly began to evolve back then as venetian traders found they needed tools and techniques for keeping track of their expanding business ventures and what reports did come up when what reports did they come up with first 
balance sheets and income statements. Ever since, traditionally minded accountants have believed that the proper measures of a company performance are profit from the income statement and solvency and liquidity, which can be calculated from the balance sheet. Cash was generally the focus of company treasures, not the accounting professioner, profession. That began to change in 1987 when the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, pronounced FAB, FASB, ruled that all financial statements involving CPAs must henceforth include a statement of cash flow. Unfortunately, FASB allowed accountants to prepare either direct or indirect cash flow statements. Many choose and still choose indirect statements. Even though they're called cash flow statements, they include non-cash items like depreciation. We'll explain the difference in more details below. Even today, many accounting software packages don't let you compile a direct cash flow statement. Some provide no cash flow statements at all. I think sometimes they have like CPA accountant jokes and they're trying to be funny and I'm reading it and I just don't get it. Because <laughs> I'm not an accountant. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, was that supposed to be a joke? Okay. <laughs> Well, it's because it'll come into play later on that internal and external uh, accounting. So companies that had internal accountants would actually fudge numbers. Mm -hmm. So now there's actually, so that's why they're throwing that in there. And, but so because cash flow can be fudged, you can keep two different types of books. Right. And so this way, that's why it's not, um, they don't weigh their weight in gold on those. Right, 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 right. So, so they're, they're trying to be like, hearty, har, har. And I was like, what? Yeah, it's like, okay, great. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so FASB, which stands for Financial Accounting Standards Board, ruled contain, rule contained other sources of confusion as well. The board debated back and forth how various terms on cash flow statement would be defined and where they should appear. They decided, for example, that a line known as net cash provided by operating activities, one kind of bottom line on the cash flow statement, would come after lines such as taxes and interest. In other words, as you worked your way down the cash flow statement, subtracting cash going out from cash coming in, you'd have to subtract taxes and interest payments before arriving at that net figure. Meanwhile, however, the line in the income statement labels operating labeled operating income, a line that plays much the same role on the income statement that net cash from operating activity plays on the cash flow statement, is generally calculated before subtracting taxes and interest. So mm -hmm. the two lines look similar, but aren't aren't even parallel in the way they figure. Did you want to add something? Mm -mm. Oh, you yep. good? Okay. I'm, I'm, like I'm, I'm tracking. I'll add something in here when we get towards the end. So cool, cool. when we get to the thing. And then there's the question, why accountants can't say something simple like operating cash flow instead of net cash provided by operating activities, but that's beyond the scope of this book. Cash flow statements are a great idea, but they haven't yet come well un become well understood and well utilized even by some accounting professionals. Maybe there hasn't been enough time. Maybe there hasn't been enough training. Your accountant might still tell you that you should rely on your income statement rather than your cash flow statement to see how your company is doing, even though the whole point is to use both, not one or the other, alongside with the balance sheet. Your accountant might also tell you that the indirect cash flow statement he or she prepares is just fine. Trust us, it isn't. A direct cash flow statement is analogous to a checkbook. It shows the cash that is actually coming in and going out and organizes these cash flows into categories that you'll find useful in managing the business. That's the kind of cash flow statement we'll we will describe in this chapter. The advantage of such a statement is that it clearly shows cause and effects and thus helps you understand how to correct any cash flow problems you may have. In, in, in an indirect cash flow statement is different. To prepare one, an accountant begins with the income statement and makes various adjustments so that the cash that it shows cash flows. Say that 15 times fast. Mm -hmm. An indirect cash flow statement for Soho Equipment Inc. is presented in Appendix 1. Even though an accurate indirect statement produces the same operating cash flow figure as a direct one, the statement itself isn't intuitive, and so it's hard for non-financial people to understand and use. If you do 
if you if you do have to survive with an indirect cash flow statement it isn't the end of the world the only presentation of operating cash flow is different if it's at all possible though we suggest that you ask your accountant to compile a direct cash flow statement showing what is going on and at, going into and out of the bank this kind of standalone statement meets the criteria for everything you'd want in a report about cash flow it shows clearly whether the cash generated from everyday business operations aka operating cash flow or ocf is positive or negative for the period of time you're looking at and by how much second it shows how much cash was invested in the business how much was received from lenders and investors and how much was paid to lenders and investors it shows whether the cash you received from all sources was more or less than the cash you paid out and by how much like the income statement the cash flow statement is a movie of events during a given time span it shows you the other side the cash side of what happened in your business do you want to add something here yeah so it is like keeping a register it basically you do need to know what is your real-time money and your income statement is usually prepared at the end of the month sometimes people do bi-monthly quarterly that kind of thing so if you need to know real-time money that's where the cash flow statement comes in cool. but if you're not don't have a lot coming in and going out you can manage then doing the the monthly going off the monthly just income statements you're able to get an idea but right yeah if you need to keep your num your finger on numbers then that's the best way to do it okay cool soho equipment first year cash flow when we were we were reviewing bill and carolyn's startup balance sheet you may have noticed an important fact they started soho equipment with only twenty five thousand dollars in cash all the rest of the two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars they paid for kyle williams's assets went towards inventory fixed assets and goodwill twenty five thousand dollars is a nice chunk of change but it is not a lot of money for a business of this size to have in the bank Every two weeks, Soho's payroll comes due, and it must be paid in cash. Every month, rent and office expenses have to be paid in cash. Granted, the company started out with $75,000 worth of inventory, which would, would be, could be sold. But Bill and Carolyn had not, not only had to sell it, they had to collect from their customers, and their new policy was to give customers 30 days to pay. Meanwhile, of course, Bill was ordering new inventory, and that would have had to be paid for at some point in the not so distant future as it happened cash was a constant headache during the first year bill and carolyn didn't see the problem for a while because soho's customers still expected to pay on delivery and a few of them actually did bob thomas their first customer wrote a check before charlie even finished had even finished installing installing the new system but as time went on customers learned that they had 30 days to pay and of course they took advantage of that fact the company's cash situation grew more and more precarious Payrolls and other bills came due relentlessly. Most of the vendors Bill dealt with were willing to extend Soho credit on the basis of personal guarantee from the new owners. But as soon as the payment term, 10 days or 30 days or whatever was up, they were on the phone wanting to know when they could be paid. Bill had the job of managing the cash and it took an inordinate amount of time. He began offering customers discounts for early payments. He learned a dozen different ways of telling creditors the check is in the mail without actually using those words. He never actually missed a payroll though he though he made one one only though he made one only by making the landlord wait an extra week for his rent check finally and late in the fiscal year bill realized the truth the company was running out of cash it took him a while to come to this conclusion because he didn't entirely understand how it could be true sales were good the accountant had told him that soho's operating loss would be small bill knew he was managing the cash as carefully as he could so where was the problem the fact was he wasn't sure, but he could see that it wasn't going away. In late May, he visited the bank looking for a loan, only to learn that banks rarely lend money to small struggling companies. In June, he persuaded Carolyn that they should take the only step open to them, applying for a home equity loan on top of their mortgage. They couldn't get much, only $11,000, but it was something, and it would tie them over. Once Bill and Carolyn had their money, they immediately turned around and loaned it to the company. At the end of Soho's first first fiscal year, the company's accountant prepared a direct cash flow statement. It looked like this. I can't stay too long on this page because I got to pick up my daughter. But take a screenshot. 
Here, I'll put mine up. Thank you. Um, line items on the cash flow statement. Cash flow statements aren't always identically formatted from one company to another. Still, most direct statements follow a pattern similar to SOHO's. Note that all the cash numbers are identical or indicated as either positive or negative. Positive indicate an increase in cash. Negative in numbers in create indicate a decrease. The reason is this. On a cash flow statement, not all the inflows are at the top. Rather, the statement is divided into three categories, each with its related inflows and outflows. Operating cash flow, OFC, or cash flow from operating activities. The first several lines of the statement reflect cash related to a business's operation. Collections is the top line, and in ordinary circumstances, represents a company's biggest inflow of cash. It's all the cash a business collects from outstanding receivables or from cash sales. Since this is cash flowing in, it's represented by a positive number. Soho Equipment collected $470,000 from its customers during the first year. Cash paid to suppliers or inventory paid. This is cash that is the bis that the business spent during the period to produce inventory. It includes cash spent on goods or material that go into inventory and in manufacturing companies. Cash spent for the direct labor and factory overhead required to produce the inventory. Remember that the company that bought the golf shirts in March and sold them over the following three months? It would record a big inventory paid item in its cash flow statement in whatever month it paid the bill for those shirts. Soho Equipment spent $380,000 on goods for resale during the first year. Since this is cash flowing out, it counts as a negative number when you're adding up the line items. In companies that do not have inventory, this item would probably be called costs paid. Note that the companies that buy inventory on credit can use simple, the simple approach to cash flow statements described in this chapter unless they are committed to a tracking measure called payable days. Payable days is ex discussed in Appendix 2. Expenses paid, MSG&A paid. This includes all the checks the company writes over writes to cover MSG&A's expenses. Rent on the corporate office, the phone bill, office employees' paychecks, all that is included in this line item. Since Soho, like other retailers, includes only the cost of goods for the resale on its cost of goods sold and inventory paid lines, all other operating expenses are included under MSG&A and expenses paid. So the $105,000 spent during the first year, or I like to say used during the first year, includes payroll, rent, and so on. This item also counts negative when you're adding up your cash flow. Interest and other paid. The $1,000 on Soho's line is the interest paid to Kyle Williams on the note he holds. No interest has yet has been paid on Bill and Carolyn's own loan to the company. They'll probably put it off for a while anyway. This number is normally negative, but it doesn't have to be. For example, if a company holds somebody else's debt and receives interest payments, that positive amount is included on this line. Payments for other expenses, such as flood recovery, would show up here as well. Income, ta income taxes paid. This line includes all checks a company wrote to the federal and state governments for income taxes. This is always negative, unless for some reason you get a tax refund that's greater than your tax paid. Soho's income tax payments, of course, are zero. Although the cash flow statements has three categories, it really only has one bottom line. OFC. Cash flow from operating activities or operating cash flow shows how much cash the company generated from operations. Soho is Soho's is sixteen thousand dollars, which helps you understand why twenty five thousand the twenty five thousand dollars that Bill and Carolyn started didn't give them much of a cushion. Investing cash flow or cash flow from investing art activities. The second grouping of line on the cash flow statement reflects cash spent on investments, and the first item is a fixed asset investment. This is the cash spent to buy plant, property, or equipment. Remember, it's cash, so there's no depreciation or any or other abstraction involved. If you pay $25,000 cash for a delivery truck in August, your cash flow statement for August shows a $25,000 item for a fixed asset investment. If your company spends cash on intangible assets such as a patent, on equity in another company, or on long-term certificates of deposit, that expenditure shows up on a second line, usually labeled "Others Investments." Other investments. Soho Equipment spent nothing on nothing on fixed assets or other investments during the company's first year. 
These lines are summed up as cash, cash flow from investing activities or investing cash flow. This number is usually negative because cash is flowing out, but in some circumstances it could be positive. For example, if you sell property, plant, or equipment, or if you receive cash from another investment, the amount received is recorded on this line and will offset any expenditure of cash. Financing cash flow, FCF, or cash flow from financing activities. The third group reflects cash received from or spent on or used on financing activities. Financing activity is an accountant ease for money coming from or going to lenders or investors. It includes the following items. Borrow, payback, is any cash received by the company from borrowing. If your business takes out a loan or draws on a line of credit, the cash is counted here. This line also includes any principal you paid back on a loan, so it could be a positive or negative number depending on the difference between borrowing and paying back in time, period covered by cash, the cash flow statement. Remember that interest paid or received, however, shows up under operating cash flow. The $11,000 loan Soho received from its owners shows up here. Paid in, paid out is all the cash received from stockholders for the sale of stock minus all cash paid options to stockholders for stock buybacks. Soho has nothing in either category during its first year of operation. Dividends. Paid to stockholders are separate line item. A cash withdrawal by a sole proprietor, usually called the owner's draw, not a dividend, may show up here. Again, Soho has zero, from which we can conclude that Bill and Carolyn aren't taking money out of the business yet. Not surprising. Um, oh my gosh, what the heck does it say? Oh, it's increase slash decrease in cash or change in cash is the summation of the cash flow statement. Change in cash is all the cash paid to your company minus all cash paid out. You arrive at this number simply by adding up all the others. Beginning cash shows what the company started with. Ending cash is what it wound up with. Ca changing cash is the difference. Unfortunately, Soho ended up the year with $5,000 less in cash than it started with, even though it had received an $11,000 cash infusion from the loan. So, Jen, I'm going to let you keep reading. Um, I'm going to make you the co-host, or I'll figure out what I need to do, because i got to run to get Bella. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Right, cool. Good, you can continue reading. Okay, so dissecting the cash flow statement. The real power of a standalone cash flow statement lies in the fact that it can be broken down into these three categories, each of which reveals important information about a business. Operating cash flow, your OCF, shows the cash a company is generating internally from everyday business operations. Investing cash flow, ICF, covers each cash spent for fixed asset assets and intangible assets, along with any receipts for sale or fixed and intangible assets. Financing cash flow, FCF, shows cash received from lenders and investors minus any cash paid them. These three fit together in two simple equations. So you have your OCF, your ICF, so your OCF, plus ICF plus FCF equals your final so change in cash. But your ending cash is your beginning cash plus change in cash. So you have to figure out what your change in cash is to plug it into the equation of your ending cash and beginning cash. So, well, you have to have your beginning cash and changing cash to equal your ending cash. Knowing your operating, investing, and financial cash flows lets you manage your company's change in cash. So, if you have a recent cash flow statement from your own company, you may want to get it out and uh, analyze your own OCF, ICF, and SFCF, which is your operating cash flow your investing cash flow, and your financing cash flow. Operating cash flow. OCF is the lifeblood of the company. After all, a company generates cash in only three ways, from operating operations, 
from selling assets and from lenders and investors, borrowing money or selling stock. But cash from operations is the most important of the three. No company can live long on the basis of selling assets. And if you can't generate cash from operations, lenders and investors aren't usually going to be willing to give you their money. So a healthy OCF, which is your operating cash flow, is one big key to a successful business. You should be thinking about your OCF every day and checking it every month. So this is the most important line of the cash flow statement. More important than ending cash or change in cash or anything else. You can be GE or Microsoft, but if you don't have a healthy ongoing OCF, you're on the way down. The companies that really need a lot of cash in the bank are those that don't have a healthy OCF. Those that are not those that are just starting up and don't expect to have positive OCF for a while, or those that don't have a financing line in place. Investing cash flow. When you analyze ICF, the most important line to look at is the amount spent on fixed assets. This is a good measure of your company's investment in its future. If you're hoping to get outside investing investment someday, for example, investors will look carefully at your level of fixed assets, asset investments, and at the trend in fixed asset investment over time. So they want to see the money coming in. They want to see where it is going, how you're spending it, and that you have money left over at the end of the month. So single out OCF and ICF on the cash flow statement. Compare them and you'll get a very good indication of how your company is financing its fixed asset investment. Some capital intensive high growth companies will maintain an ICF greater than OCF for a period of years. Over the long term, however, most companies want OCF to be greater than ICF, which is your investing cash flow. That is, they want to fund investment internally at, so as to reduce their dependence on outside sources of financing. Financing cash flow, FCF, finally shows, finally shows your relationship to and dependence on investors and lenders. Are you repaying your outstanding loans or is your indebtedness growing? So is your debt growing from loans or are you able to pay those off? Are you having to sell more stock in your company to finance your cash needs? Are you paying your stockholders dividends? So total FCF can be positive or negative depending on a business's circumstances. So this takes a whole overview of your whole business finances. But the owner of the business must always know why it is what it is. In other words, where the cash is going and where it's coming from. Before we leave the subject of cash, we want to tell a story about a company you think would hardly have to worry about cash flow, General Electric. Jack Welsh took over GE as CEO around 1980 and processed and proceeded to transform it. He reduced the payroll substantially. He sold off dozens of businesses and acquired dozens of others. No, not everybody likes to give Neutron Jack credit, but there's no denying that his moves paid off handsomely in terms of profitability. GE's net profits have increased about 10% per year since Welch took over. Given the way the stock market values companies, you would expect GE stock price to rise about 10% per year as well. And so it did until the early 1990s. Then the stock price failed to keep up with earning growth. Welch consulted with his financial experts to, to figure out why. One of them pointed out that although net profits were increasing 10% per year, Cash flow wasn't growing nearly as fast. Perhaps some astute of investors were questioning the quality of GE's earnings. After all, GE didn't seem to be doing that great a job at turning its profits into cash. In late 1991, Welsh decided to refocus his manager's attention on cash flow as well as on profitability. So he had to shift mindset. It wasn't working, so he had to stop what they were doing 
and shift mindset because that's the only way you can make a difference. Communications from the executive offices emphasize the importance of cash flow. Everyone in top management talked about it. In some cases, incentive compensation was changed to reward improvements in asset management. Pretty soon, managers began getting the message. And once they did, they began to take action, taking action. They found new ways to warehouse inventory to get products to customers faster. They began using electronic data interchange, EBI, to build customers and collect from them. They began negotiating more favorable, favorable payment terms with both customers and suppliers. A little more than a year later, GE's 1992 annual report showed that the company's net profit was again up by 10%. OCF, however, increased from $7.5 billion to $10 billion, or 33%. And sure enough, over a paralleled 12-month period, GE's stock price rose from $74 per share to $96 per share, or 30%. These amounts are in 1992 dollars and are adjusted for subsequent events such as stock splits. The moral, both profits and cash flow are important no matter how big you are and no matter how small you are. This chapter completes the review of the three key financial statements, but knowing what's on each statement is really only the beginning of using your financials to run a better business. Next, it's important to understand how the statements fit together. That will enable you to see the big financial picture of what's going on in your company. So, and that is the end of chapter four. And so quick thing too, if, if you don't know where your money is and you don't know where it's going, then how are you supposed to keep track of growth, loss, any of these kinds of things? Um, it's super important. And if you need help, like I said, accountants, uh, get in touch with an accountant in your area. Also check too, like there's QuickBooks. That is a great way to start. But if you have intricate little details that you don't know, it's always, always in your best interest to get in contact with an accountant, a CPA, that kind of thing, because they'll be able to help you navigate and lay out your business better as far as your finances go. And then that's also going to be better for you in the long run. You don't want to be a year, two years down the road. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't have money. I don't know what's going on. I have done that before. It is not great. So um, building a business as an entrepreneur, I realized I needed help. And so I have an accountant who is, I call and ask questions and who is very helpful. But with this, it's like, go through, if you don't understand a word, take time, research it, write it down, because then you'll get more clarification as you can go back through the book or go back through the videos. Because if you go past a word you don't understand, it's really gonna kind of jumble things up and things aren't going to soak in as well. So I have to do that personally. And that's what I normally recommend to my friends and and clients as well. So with that, that puts us an end to chapter four and possibly um, we'll probably do a review before we start the next chapter, which will be actually part two, which is understanding the big picture. So I thank you all for joining and we'll have, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.